All right, welcome everyone. It uh, looks like it's seven o'clock by my reckoning. Thanks for coming up. Hope you're having a, had a good dinner if that's what you had. Um, yeah, this is being recorded, so we're going out live. So uh, I'm Peter, the president of the Space Association, for those who don't know me. And we've got an interesting uh, meeting on tonight. A little bit of news. Am I not close enough? I'm not close enough. Is that better? Turn the volume up, yeah. Yeah, so February 2023, 20, my goodness, it's actually almost March, so we'll be, uh, it'll be Christmas before you know it. So just a quick run through what we're doing tonight. I've got <laughs> Space Association news, yeah, right. Uh, Australian Space News, a little bit of that, and uh, presentation, presentation on our Space Geek road trip. That was myself, Angelo de Grazia, Ashley Hill, and Michael Adilla. We tore up the nation. And then some international space news, and then we're going to have planetary missions and space science with Andrew Rennie, who I think is finishing off his Parmesan up anyway. And we, they should throw us out about nine o'clock. So just for those people not aware, we, uh, we do these monthly meetings uh, here in South Melbourne, the Golden Gate Hotel. Uh, we also run uh, a weekly radio show. Andrew Rennie does that. It's called The Space Show. We had that name before the one in America had, had it. Um, interviews, etc. It's quite an interesting show. Those shows are also a podcast. Usually a couple of days after they go to air live, uh, the podcast goes up. So just uh, follow links from the website and you'll find those. The website being space.asn.au. And once again, we are a non-profit, non-professional group. Everyone's a volunteer here. The operation of the whole uh, um, member, uh, the group is run by, uh, is funded by your membership. So for those members in the room and those online, thank you very much. And for those who aren't and you'd like to, we'd love to have you on board. And if you've lapsed your membership, we can do a special deal and join you back up at no additional charge. All right, so meetings. For this rest of this year, uh, next one is March 27. Generally, the form is fourth Monday of the month, except in December when it gets a little bit sleep. And uh, the date's on the screen. And our next, as I mentioned, the next meeting will be March 27. The reason I've got that up there is there's potentially going to be a Starship heavy launch. So who knows? Yeah, we'll watch this space. All right, so uh, as I mentioned, there's actually no, no association news this month. Um, the only real news is that we need your help. Um, the presentations are put together each month, essentially coordinated by Michael Dill, our meeting, meeting coordinator. We did endeavor to get a few speakers, or a couple of speakers this month. Looked like they were gonna go well, but they fell through at the last moment. Um, all the presentations get put together by volunteers, myself, Angelo, Andrew, etc. And if you have an interest in being a reporter for the group, we'd love to have you on board. Essentially, someone who could maybe give us a, an international space roundup if you feel motivated to, to do that. We'd love to have you make contact with us. It's uh, info at space.asn.au and uh, we'll have that included in the monthly presentation. Could be a start of a new career for you. All right, so space, strange space, just a couple of items here. Uh, a local firm launches a computing device for on-orbit data processing. So this uh, South Australian-based company called Acraft, I think it's how you pronounce it. So their uh, edge computing module successfully launched aboard the Janus-1 satellite from India recently. Uh, designed to classify Earth observation data while in orbit. So this is processing data in orbit as opposed to sending the data down to the Earth and having it processed. So the idea of this is that you process it on orbit and that what you're sending down is much less and much more refined data than what you would have dumping the whole lot down. So when you've got satellites that have low bandwidth transmission capabilities, if that data is processed on orbit, you're only sending down the official uh, the the essential information is that the official so good work so this uh janus one incorporated 10 uh, so eight organizations and created in 10 months 
with the Pulsar manufactured locally in Australia for the mission. So that's the flight. I think the picture is of a flight hardware which went up. So good on them. University of Tasmania and the Australian Space Agency unveil a new comms antenna in Tassie uh, at the Green Hill uh, site in Tasmania. And um, it's funded by the Australian Space Agency Infrastructure Fund to improve the nation's space situation awareness. So the $2 million antenna will enable monitoring of space-based objects, including satellites and debris. So that should be quite good. In fact, uh, a couple of us went down to Tasmania last year and uh, we visited the site. I don't think this antenna was up and running at that time, but um, we were interested to learn that uh, this uh, facility run by the University of Tasmania actually is involved in uh, communication with uh, SpaceX uh, launches and satellites. Because I heard it on a download when I was on the, the broadcast of a, a recent satellite, I think it was a Starlink launch last year. So I looked into it. So yeah, they've they've been contracted by SpaceX to provide some coverage for that part of the uh, the Earth's surface. So yeah, so this uh, new commons antenna will increase that um, capability, and uh, the seven point three meter. Uh, antenna will be operated by a team of University of Tasmania at the Green Hill Observatory. It was one of the team's primary tasks to provide space to Earth communications for satellites in low Earth, Earth orbit. Um, the air show uh, is going to start, I think the first day is on Tuesday for trade days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then the public days are Thursday, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So uh, I did a quick look on the database. And if you do a search based on the parameters of the types of exhibitors, there's over 230 exhibitors listed as involved in space. So it's a big part now, you know, Airbus, et cetera, Lockheed Martin, I guess, sort of thing. but there's a lot of other smaller companies and suppliers that have that category in the space area. And interesting enough, I counted 123 Australian space exhibitors. So they'll be represented in some capacity at the air show. So if you're going to be out there, just take a wander around the um, exhibitor booth, tents, and have a chat with people. There's a lot of stuff happening, actually. Of course, the Australian Space Agency, the UK Space Agency, and the Polish Space Agency, along with the CSIRO and other agencies, will be out there as well. So it might be fun to have a chat with a few of those people. I just pulled a few recognisable uh, logos of companies that you could go along and have a chat to. And uh, there's a lot more in there that uh, I haven't put on the screen, but I didn't have time, did I? Rocket Lab were there, which would be interesting. Southern launch, uh, equatorial launch, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, yeah, some ex exciting stuff there. And Melbourne Space Program are there as well. Um, I just saw this in the age the other day when I was flicking through it and we had my coffee. So the space consultant's visa was cancelled over potential security threat. So Marina Soligub has been assessed as having the potential to pose a direct or indirect threat to national security. Anyone know here? We should have Igor along to find out. Maybe he's watching. Uh, the consultant, it was a, she was a consultant working in the Australian Space Agency who boasted of close ties to the Russian government and also spent months cultivating Australian government and business contacts and has been declared a potential national security threat by the nation's spy chief. Sources have confirmed that Asia recently advised the federal government to expel Kazakhstan-born Maria Sologab uh, more than two years after she travelled from her home in Ireland to Adelaide on a distinguished talent visa. So her latest employer, the city of Marion, I, think, I assume that's where the space hub is in South Australia, I don't know, confirmed in a statement that Sologab had advised them that her visa has been cancelled. So uh, between 2011 and 27, documents created, created by Sologab uh, state that she worked for the National Space Centre in Ireland. She listed her most significant professional achievement as the development of intergovernmental agreement between Republic of Ireland and Russia Federation in use of space for civil purposes. After arriving in uh, September 2020, she worked at uh, as a, in the, at a sorry at a private space industry company and also at Deloitte's Adelaide office. Now I'll put an asterisk here because this is all sourced out of the age and they used unnamed sources. So once again, 
Um, but she's been expelled, so there might be something to this. Source at the consulting firm said that Sologob had worked for 12 weeks at Deloitte after undergoing criminal and employment screening and had no contact with Deloitte clients, including government agencies. So her LinkedIn account, she claimed to have helped Deloitte support the first Australian mission to the moon and have, have written submissions for the Australian Space Agency. So I'm not sure how much uh, embellishment went there, but um, watch this space, check under your tables and under your beds tonight in case there's a Russian space consultant there. All right, so I didn't put a presentation together this week or this month on international space. I pinched a video from um, this group called uh, Tomorrow. And it 31 raptors have roared. Russia's got another league. Blue Origin are making solar panels out of what? And a lot more news is coming your way. This is Tomorrow Space News. Let's start off with the big one, the 33-engine Static 5 that became a 31-engine Static 5 following one manual and one automatic shutdown underneath Super Heavy Booster 7. According to Elon Musk, 31 engines would have still provided enough thrust to reach orbit as redundancy is a big factor being built into Starship's design. A safe and reliable mode of transport needs high levels of redundancy as Starship is meant to start the space parallel to the modern-day aviation industry. If you thought that this was a lot of cloud being produced by 31 Raptors, then get ready, as for the orbital flight attempt, we're expecting 33 engines firing at 90% thrust. This static fire was just 50%. Apart from the two engines that were shut down, it appears as if this static fire attempt went off without a hitch, or at least that's what we're being told by SpaceX. It's a big achievement, and an important achievement, as the next time this many Raptors ignite, it will be the start of humanity's journey to Mars. Alongside the static fire, the rest of the Starbase team has been busy, with those white tanks we saw arriving on the barge last week making their way to the launch site. They've been installed on this concrete platform where they'll serve as the water deluge tanks, hopefully to try and reduce the strength of the sound waves produced by the business end of the super heavy boosters. The flapless and heat shieldless Ship 26 has been rolled out to the launch site and placed onto suborbital pad A. It is quite strange seeing a bare bones vehicle which looks to follow the basic design shared by the HLS lunar variant and the on orbit tanker variant. It's probably still a good idea to have some very tough concrete under the launch mount, just in case, which is why SpaceX has been testing out concrete at their McGregor testing facility, which is just a few hours up the road from Starbase. You can see that a metal frame holding up concrete is laying on the ground right next to this pedestal, which is conveniently placed directly in front of one of the horizontal Raptor test stands. And we can see here a couple of short firings of a Raptor at a piece of concrete. Remember when I said that Iceland was one of the European regions yet to have connectivity to the Starlink network? Well, earlier this week, SpaceX announced that Iceland now does have access to Starlink and that the previously unserved area of northern Brazil does now have service as well. Look out everyone, there's another leak on the International Space Station. It is a cool leak, but it isn't on a Soyuz. Instead, it's on the Soyuz's cargo-carrying cousin. Progress MS-21 docked to the Zenith port on the Poisk module last October, bringing up supplies for the crew on board. About five months later, on Saturday the 11th of February, a leak started in the coolant system. In September of 2022, Soyuz MS-22 was launched, carrying two cosmonauts and one American astronaut to the ISS. Three months later, it sprung a leak in the coolant system, resulting in Roscosmos fast-tracking the launch of Soyuz MS-23 to bring the crew home. Starting to notice a pattern here. Editing Ryan here as we have a new photo. With the first leak, the one on Soyuz MS-22, it was blamed on a micrometeorite impacting the service module, although you can be the judge with the imagery Roscosmos have provided. Now there's been another leak in the coolant system, this time on Progress MS-21, which is statistically highly unlikely to be another micrometeorite impact. Soyuz and Progress are different vehicles. The former is designed to take humans home and the latter is designed to burn up in the atmosphere with cargo. However, they are similar enough to share the coolant system 
in the service module, which is cause for concern with two near identical incidents in the same system in essentially the same type of spacecraft module. If this is another micrometeorite strike, then it begs the question, why is it only Russian service modules that are being hit? Why haven't we seen other impacts on other parts of the ISS? Or was the first leak not a micrometeorite strike and Roscosmos lied to NASA about it? Does the coolant system have a manufacturing defect? That's just some of the speculation we're seeing swirling around on the internet at the moment, and NASA is going to be operating the Canada Arm 2 robotic arm to try and get a better look at the damage. They've also confirmed that the crew are in no danger, which is of course the most important thing. Let's not forget what happened in 2021, with the Nauka Science module firing its thrusters when it shouldn't have been, or the Soyuz launch incident in 2018 that saw the abort system fire up. Will this list of non-nominal incidents continue, and does Russia need to step up their game when it comes to spacecraft reliability and safety? For the time being at least, we'll need to play the waiting game whilst NASA asks the questions. Blue Origin's upcoming heavy lift launch vehicle, New Glenn, has won its first launch contract with NASA. The contract is to fly the Escape and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorers, or Escapade, mission to Mars. Comprised of two small satellites, this mission was originally scheduled to launch alongside Psyche last year. However, with that mission's delay to October 2023, the required trajectory for Escapade was no longer physically possible with a Psyche rideshare. According to NASA, Escapade is a mission designed to, quote, understand the processes controlling the structure of Mars's hybrid magnetosphere and how it guides ion flows, understand how energy and momentum are transported from the solar wind through Mars's magnetosphere, and understand the processes controlling the flow of energy and matter into and out of the collisional atmosphere. Now you might be thinking heavy lift launch vehicle and small satellites aren't meant to go together, and you'd be right. There's a good possibility that Escapade will be flying alongside a heavier payload on New Glenn, either a customer or an internal Blue Origin payload. Or another possibility is that Escapade could just be offsetting the cost of a New Glenn test flight. NASA is handing 20 million US dollars to Blue for this flight, so they could just be killing two birds with one stone. What it does mean, however, is that 2023 should be the year we start seeing more New Glenn testing if they want to be ready to launch during the 2024 Mars transfer window, which is only three weeks long. Do you think Blue Origin will be ready for the 2024 Earth-Mars transfer window? Let us know what you think in the comments. It's another Blue Origin story, one which is pretty freaking cool. You see this solar cell right here? This was manufactured out of Lunar Regolith Simulant, the first step of a project ran by Blue to try and create solar cells out of Lunar Regolith on the Moon. This would mean that electrical energy could be produced natively, with no need to rely on ships from Earth, meaning that a colony could operate independently, something that SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk has been vocal about before. Using an electrical current, iron, silicon and aluminium is separated from oxygen through a process which is called molten regolith electrolysis. All of the elements can then be used separately with the iron, silicon and aluminium for solar cells and the oxygen for life support. Molten regolith electrolysis purifies the silicon to more than 99.999%, which according to Blue Origin is required for efficient solar cells. This process also just uses sunlight and the silicon from Blue Origin's reactor compared to the Earth-based process which outputs, quote, large amounts of toxic and explosive chemicals. The electrolysis process also creates glass that is strong enough to protect the solar cells for over a decade, giving those living and working on the lunar surface plenty of time to manufacture replacement cells. This technology has been dubbed Blue Alchemist, which Blue Origin themselves have admitted is technically ambitious. However, they have the technology right now. I think the best tagline to take away from this incredible technology is unlimited solar power wherever we need it. They've apparently been working on this since 2021, so it proves that even though they don't talk about it too often, Blue Origin are working on some epic stuff behind the scenes. What do we have here? A booster being fueled? How exciting! Sadly, we didn't get a static fire, but we did get a spin prime test of one Raptor engine. A spin prime is when the turbo pumps are spun up, but there's not meant to be any ignition. We've also gotten two beautiful full speed quick disconnect tests to observe. That was the first, and this is the second. It doesn't seem that impressive until you remember that the QD housing is the size of a small building. 
Sitting near the launch mount are these steel covers, which are going to wrap around the OAM, protecting all of the plumbing on the outside near the business end of the booster. They're currently being slotted over this section right here, similar to how the pipes running up the launch mount lake have been shielded. It's getting exciting down on the space coast as the capsule launching SpaceX's Crew-6 mission has arrived at the Horizontal Integration Facility at Launch Complex 39A. Crew Dragon Endeavour was once again soaking up the spotlight as she prepares for her fourth mission. Her previous three have been Demo-2, Crew-2 and Axion-1. Japan's brand new H3 rocket finally made it to the pad after a decade of development last week. However, sadly, the inaugural launch was not to be. Shortly after igniting the two main engines, and just a fraction of time before the solid rocket boosters were to ignite, the main engines were shut off and the vehicle went nowhere. As the saying goes, however, you'd rather be wishing that you were in the air on the ground than wishing you were on the ground in the air. We're still not sure why this launch attempt didn't go to plan, however, I think everybody is grateful that it wasn't the SRBs which ignited, because after that point, you committed to going into the sky, whether you wanted to or not. The H3 is intended to be a cheaper way of getting into space when compared to Mitsubishi's current workhorse, the H2A. And don't worry, the subfixes of different numbers are still here. The first number after H3 is the number of engines on the first stage. The second number is the amount of solid rocket boosters strapped onto the side. And the final character is a letter, either S, L or W, which stands for short fairing, long fairing and wide fairing. So now that we have that understood, the inaugural launch attempt was of the H322S variant, meaning it had two LE9 engines underneath the first stage, two solid rocket boosters on the side, and a short fairing. Similar to NASA's SLS, the H3 is a hydrogen fueled vehicle, and also like NASA's SLS, the H3 is going to be supporting the Artemis program. Japan's next generation HTV-X cargo resupply spacecraft will be launched on a future planned triple core variant of the H3 which will resupply the Lunar Gateway space station with cargo for the crew on board. Here's a positive story for Boeing Starliner. According to NASA's commercial crew program manager, they're 80% ready for their crew flight test, which is currently scheduled for April. Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams will be flying to the International Space Station on the United States' second commercial crew vehicle, similar to SpaceX's Demo-2 mission with Crew Dragon, which saw Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley fly to the ISS back in 2020. The only outstanding major issue yet to be addressed from Starliner's second orbital flight test is the orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters failing in the service module. Now being such an important system, you may be wondering why this issue hasn't been addressed yet and the answer is pretty simple. Unlike the capsule, the service module is jettisoned before re-entry and it doesn't survive the journey home. So unlike the other issues, teams on the ground can't inspect actual hardware. So instead, they've had to just go off the telemetry they had access to during the flight. This data is expected to have been fully reviewed by early March, ready for a mid to late April launch attempt that will fit in with ULA's schedule with the inaugural flight of Vulcan. Before we get into the week's orbital launches, here's a feel-good story from Rocket Lab. They've been using their helicopters, which are usually kitted out to try and catch spent stages falling back to Earth, to help with the response efforts following Cyclone Gabrielle, the worst cyclone to hit New Zealand since 1968, and the most expensive cyclone to ever strike in the Southern Hemisphere, with the current damages estimated to be around 8.12 billion, with a B, US dollars. Rocket Lab have been delivering food and essential supplies that they've been donating to Mejia, where their launch site is based, and other communities which have been affected by the cyclone. Luckily for the company, their facilities haven't been damaged, which they've acknowledged as being fortunate. Because of this, it also puts Rocket Lab in a stronger position to help out their fellow Kiwis. All of the traffic activity is focused around the end of the week, starting off with Starlink Group 2 Mission 5, which commenced at 19.12 Universal Time on Friday the 17th of February from Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. All 51 satellites were successfully delivered to their initial orbit, and they'll soon be raising themselves to their final 570km, 70-degree low Earth orbits. The booster supporting this mission, the 1063, successfully returned to Earth by landing on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You.
Just a short while later, at 0226 UTC on Saturday the 18th, Progress MS-21 undocked from the Zenith port on the Poisk module and began its deorbiting procedure. This was the cargo resupply spacecraft which had a coolant leak which we reported on last week, so if you want to learn more about that, make sure to go and check out that episode of the news. As of 0315 UTC on the 19th, Progress MS-21 is no more, and all of the rubbish left on board has burnt up in the atmosphere. Less than two hours after the undocking of Progress MS-21, SpaceX was launching again, this time from the east coast of the United States with Inmarsat I-6F2 from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Commencing at 0359 UTC on Saturday, this mission successfully delivered the geostationary communication satellite to its geostationary transfer orbit. Once fully circularized, F2 will be able to communicate with the ground via its 9-meter aperture L-band antenna and its 9-ka band antennas. It's a busy week for departures coming up with ChinaSat 26 launching on a Long March 3BE on Thursday. The first mission of Starlink Group 6 is also going up on Thursday. The fast tracked emergency Soyuz MS 23 vehicle will be launching to the International Space Station on Friday. An unknown payload will also be launching on Friday on a Long March 2C from Xiuquan. And Sunday will see the launch of the next four astronauts to the ISS with SpaceX's Crew 6 flight with American Commander Stephen Bowen, American pilot Warren Hoburg, Russian launch dynamics engineer Andrei Fidiev and Emirati ISS engineer Sultan Al Niedi. All right, um, that uh, that video is courtesy of TMRO uh, tomorrow, and Ryan Caton is the host. So um, thanks for that. If you want. Oh, Jimi Hendrix. I had turned it up a little bit. No worries. Yeah, so if you want to watch his videos, they're really quite good. It comes out on a regular basis. Just go to TMRO and then YouTube and search on your on your Google engine and you'll get to that page and subscribe. Um, and an update on one of the missions that he mentioned, the Crew 6 it was supposed to go off this afternoon at 5.45. They had a scrub uh, due to some ground equipment related to the TTAC. I think it's the helps some system that helps the engines ignite. So I'm not sure when that'll be happening again, possibly a 24 hour scrub, but uh, I guess we'll find out shortly how long they might take to fix that. All right, now the highlight, well, um, we, um, a few of the members of the association, uh, Ashley, Angelo, myself and Michael, took what we call a Space Geek road trip, uh, week last week and the weekend before well the weekend before yeah so we uh, went up to canberra in uh, angelo's brand new modelly tesla model y tesla i call it modelly um so yeah so uh, angelo is the model y owner the co-pilot <laughs> and a friend's geek ashley was a chief pilot and instructor and the lead db geek Boy, Michael and I learned so much about DVDs that we never want to talk about it again. And Michael was in charge of crew sanity. Um, I'm not sure how successful he was. Um, but this was in the instruction manual at the first page. So I was a bit concerned when I first got into the car. Yeah, so the trip was fun. We On Friday, we left uh, from Melbourne and um, drove up to Canberra with a few stops for petrol, no, electricity, charging stops. On Saturday, we went out to the Canberra Deep Space Tracking uh, Centre out in Timbinbilla and got a VIP tour there. And then on Sunday, we went out to the former site of the Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station uh, with a VIP host. And then we drove home Sunday afternoon slash evening. So this was a regular occasion in this trip, stopping at the, um, at the charging station. Of course, we had to get something to eat and drink and go to the toilet, so it really wasn't that big an inconvenience, and it actually made the whole trip go really well. And um, we all felt quite uh, relaxed and comfortable after the... Uh, how long was the trip on the first day? We left my place about noon, got there about 9.30. Well, we went to a charging place for half an hour, so it was pretty good. And this is a picture of Angelo's. And this is Andrew testing the auto drive 
he did have his eyes open some of the time and he did have his hands on the steering wheel some of the time. So <laughs> it's got lots of, lots of airbags in the EV. So, yeah. And this is what Angel, uh, Michael and I were subjected to for eight hours. Because there's no line stuff, it's like it'll say when autopilot can be turned on and when it can't. It's all right. Even though there's no lines, I can turn autopilot on. Yeah. Yeah. So now it'll, it'll figure it out. Yeah, there's enough, it knows enough about the road. Nerd Central. I think I said Nerd Central. <laughs> we managed to get some Beatles music played, so that broke it up a little bit, which is good. Uh, yeah, so Saturday we went out to um, to Chip and Bill. We met, met up with uh, Professor Michael um, uh, Malcolm Davis. He's uh, from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute with expertise in uh, defence, space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I had breakfast with him, and then we went out to to um, Cambodia Space Tracking Centre. We met up with Glenn Nagel uh, out there. Now the actual centre is closed to the public at the moment, but uh, we made a deal with him. So uh, yeah, we got a VIP tour of the facility. And despite this sign about turning everything off, Angela's car didn't observe that sign. It's very smart, but it couldn't stop transmitting or something. So we tried. <laughs> the car was in control. Anyway, um, so yeah, here's a bit of an overview of the of the site. Just a couple of the dishes there. The, DSS 46, which is the uh, former uh, dish that was out at Honeysuckle Creek, used to receive the first TV from the moon back in, well, it wasn't the first, Goldstone got it, but it was the best at that stage. Um, it's now been moved over to, to Tibbinbilla. DSS 43, we'll talk about that in a moment. So this is a general layout of everything. This is DSS 43. And I love the street names that they've got there. Plantry Road, Cassini Drive, Voyager Road, and I can't remember what the other one was. So here's the Space Geeks with the DSS 36, which is one of their newer dishes uh, with a really interesting um, uh, construction. And I believe that Glenn said it's gonna be fitted or is fitted partially for optical tracking as well, which is quite a new um, technology that they're experimenting with. So yeah, there's Malcolm Davis on the left, Michael, myself, Angelo, and Ashley. Now, I mentioned before about uh, the dish that was used to track uh, Apollo, well, the user received signals from Apollo 11 on the lunar surface. That was called DSS-44 when it was out at Honeysuckle Creek. And this is a picture roughly taken in about 1969. So that's the dish there tilted and being in use. This is the dish now. It's been, as I say, relocated to Tibbinbilla. They did commission it. They were using it for a number of years. I think they finished using that in 2005 or something like that. They stopped using it. It's, it's in a stow position now. Um, there was talk a few years ago uh, that the students at Canberra University were going to fire it up and get it used, running again, but that has not at this stage happened. You'll notice those big blocks on the ground there. <laughs> Sorry, Glenn was explaining that um, when it was up at uh, Honeysuckle Creek, it could, had a certain amount of tilt. And what they were aiming to do uh, when they relocated to Tidman Billa is to make the dish slightly bigger and have a greater tilt. So they raised the whole thing up on these blocks. Um, so there we are in front of that famous dish. So the TV from the moon, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Goldstone in America had the initial TV signal um, and people might recall, or at least have seen the video, it came in upside down because of the switch configuration in, in Goldstone. And this is kind of the quality of the TV that eventually came through, through Honeysuckle and then later on it moved over to Parks. So it was pretty good, but it was a bit fuzzy and a bit, ghosty. Um, this is um, a picture taken by one of the guys at uh, Honeysuckle Creek at the time with his camera. And you can just see, this is on a slow screen monitor. 
you can see the quality that they would have been seeing. So essentially what happened is that, uh, as I say in the description there, that image was essentially um, re-photographed with a TV camera to convert it to, to you know, terrestrial garden variety NTS in the US and Australia for broadcast around the world. So it had a conversion process. So there was a, a plan or an effort a few years ago to try and find the original tape recordings of those uh, slow scan images that were actually were received and were recorded, but they they don't have any anymore. So essentially what happened was they the tapes that they were put on were seen as being resource resources for the network and the TV was interesting and the data was interesting. The data was all taken off and saved. TV was kind of, you know, that's a side benefit. Bottom line is it went back into the cycle and they were recorded over. So those tapes essentially no longer exist. And this is the, the space geeks pointing up at that dish. Okay, so one of the purposes uh, for this trip to going up there is that um, I was donating of some items that I'd collected over the years. People who know me a little bit know that I'm a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, what do you call it? Kleptomaniac? No, not kleptomaniac. I collect things. Anyway, <laughs> kleptomaniac. So I'd gotten a few things when I was in the States and other places. So I decided to uh, to donate them to Glenn, uh, to his museum, which he's got a small, people have been to the Honeysuckle Creek, uh, so the Tipman Villa Visitor Centre. There is a small museum there. Once again, it is close to the public at the moment, but they have plans to make a much, much bigger museum. And uh, I floated the idea uh, of donating these things and he was over the moon, pardon the pun. Um, so anyway, we got up there and on that day we had the car loaded up, Angelo's car loaded up with space junk and we went out and he goes, oh, this is a shed we keep it all in and you should have seen this shed. It was huge and there's so much amazing stuff in there that we spent, I don't know, an hour and a half in there. Um, he said, sadly, I guess there's a lot of deceased estates and they are getting a lot of donations of, of items in, which is great because, you know, if they weren't donated, you know, some person born in this millennium would say, oh, what's this rubbish? We'll just put in the, in the dumpster and, you know, clear out grandpa's house and be done with it. So there's a huge amount of stuff there. And I've got a few pictures of some of the things that I thought were pretty cool. So this is uh, a visitor's book at... Uh, at uh, Honeysuckle Creek when John Gorton came out and visited the station on moonwalk day. You know, like all the guys who were just sitting around ready for him, it was not planned and no one knew about it. And he was there hanging over their shoulders. So anyway, he wrote in the visitor's book, which is quite, quite nice that this day, something changed. This day men first sent through space and landed on a satellite. Mankind can now gaze at each other with wild surmise as to what future travel in space may bring. And I read in actually on the, um, Colin McCullough's website, honeysucklegreek.net about this. And that's a quote from a 19th century author who wrote when they wrote another book, which is kind of nice that he used that, channeled that influence. So yeah, once again, lots of interesting things, flight plans, EKG system, um, diagrams, etc. The uh, right hand side there, that's uh, EKG readings uh, by, I think it was uh, Armstrong and, and Aldrin while they were on the moon. Actually, when, actually one was when Neil was coming down the ladder and stepping on the moon, his, his heart rate went right up, which you'd kind of understand. And here's our trusty archivist, Michael. We all were taking lots of photos, I must admit. I'll tell you what, I'm glad the film days are gone. We would have gone through so many rolls of film. Um, Glenn on the left-hand side there with just amazing stuff he pulled out. You know, there's some headphones from the console guys. Um, in the middle of there is uh, some of the uh, woven computer circuits and Angela is holding that, it folds out and uh, quite beautiful uh, engineering involved in that. Um, top left hand side, that's the hatch that I donated and me down the bottom left taking it in. Uh, it's a hatch from the uh, Apollo Soyuz test program, um, um, a docking adapter. 
well, a mock-up of it, training it that the astronauts use to train. No, well, that did, but this this is a mock-up, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Gemini capsule, a big Gemini capsule. It's about the size of this table. I wanted to take it at home, but anyway. Um, some beautiful uh, you know, circa 1960, mid 60 models of the lunar module and the command module. That helmet is uh, a helmet that was worn by Dan Quayle, the vice president to George H.W. Bush, who visited uh, the station. And here's the space geeks out front of the operations center, the operations building. And this is what we did. Pictures in here. You can take pictures in here, but it's not that close up. Don't make close up of the previous. Yeah. Okay. So this is the the mission, the main control center, and essentially what happens is it's part of the deep space, deep space network, which if you have any understanding of what that is, around the world is basically three stations: Australia, Tim Billa, US Goldstone, California, and Madrid in Spain. And of course, the world is round, Steve. I need to keep you up to date with that, and it spins. So being able to track and communicate with something in deep space requires at least one site on the earth to be available to point at whatever you're tracking. So these centers, amazingly, this is a control center and essentially they can control all the dishes from that station around the world. And they've got this, I don't know if you've seen pictures of mission control in the more modern era, the shuttle era. They've got like a phone with a touch pin. He can pick up the phone and hit a button and talk to the operations guy in Madrid or the guy in California and whoever else. So yeah, there was um, four of these stations. I think there was only one or two, or two, one was not being used and, and uh, one was, or two or three were in, in use at that time. And on the big board above, I think I got a picture later on, showing you all the different objects that have been tracked by all the different dishes around the world, quite phenomenal. And uh, it was, in fact, they were using, um, of using some of these facilities for the recent Artemis mission, uh, tracking them in deep space. So that was an essential. I asked a question. I don't think it does. This is basically a communication network. So the mission control center essentially would be controlling the missions, whether it's, I think they only do unmanned things, but it's, this is kind of the telephone exchange. So if I'm controlling a satellite or sending commands to a satellite, I send my commands from my mission control center through the telephone network up to the satellite, et cetera, and receive it back the other way. But I'm not a scientist, so that's probably completely incorrect. That's correct, yeah. The entire network is run by JPL. This is a JPL station. However, it's run in Australia by CSIRO with Australian staff. Now this gentleman, I, I didn't get his name, Angelo. He, he was the guy, the manager on the Richard, Richard something, Richard something uh, who was very patient with us. And of course, we're all space geeks. So we thought, well, we, we, I think we buttoned in for about an hour and they asked him all sorts of crazy questions, which he seemed to enjoy. So uh, he was uh, amongst friends. Now, I'm not sure what was going on here on the left-hand side, but there was a can of Glen 20 in the middle of the room. I don't know. Um, yeah, but this is, we, we stood there for about 25 minutes shooting questions and getting answers from, from uh, the guys. And the guys sitting down were actually live managing the tracking. And at that stage, they were tracking Voyager 2 and various other Soho. And if you're, oh, is Soho still up? I don't know. You anyway, know, there's a picture there, uh, I think I've got later on, showing you the tracking. And if you want, you can go anytime to, I think they're called NASA Eyes. It's, well, just search up Deep Space Network, JPL or whatever, and go to your website. And there's a website that's got all the dishes around the world and all the tracking, what they're doing and what they've got coming up. So you can actually see what's, what's happening in real time. Now, this is Chris Kraft from the old Mercury days. So I just thought I'd channel um, 
Chris, I took my own shot. I know, a poor imitation. Um, yeah, so they've got a visitor center we went over to eventually. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Michael and Ashley tried on their spacesuits. A uh, bit of a snug figure, I think, a fit for a couple of them anyway. Um, some really cool uh, exhibits and, and Glenn was <laughs> amazing. He goes, oh, we had all this stuff come over for, over the years for different displays and exhibitions and stuff. And most of the time they never took it back. So it all gets stored. So he rummaged around this um, store, open boxes. And here on the left-hand side is the flown TV camera from the Apollo Soyuz test mission. I mean, it was about this big, you know, not your little camcorder, but it's got a, a TV screen and all the controls. So, um, so yeah, when Glenn found it, he tracked down some of the guys at NASA in the video section and he's going, well, 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 can you give me the history of this? And he goes, oh, I'm not sure. Has it got the handle on the bottom? He goes, yeah, well, that's the one that flew. <laughs> so, and then they got all the cross, cross reference, all the reference numbers and things like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, Left hand side there, there's a Hasselblad camera. I don't know where that one flew. I can't remember yet. Remember? Well, we asked that very question. And he said that um, things come out for uh, traveling road shows, exhibitions, and shows, and whatever, and they don't take it back. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, that question, yeah, that question was about how this stuff ended up in Australia. So for the people watching at home, yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. Glenn really doesn't know. I mean, there has been multiple um, um, shows and exhibits and promotional things over the years. And I guess Tim and Bill is a, you know, a, a centre run essentially by JPL in the US and NASA. So it's kind of a logical place to send this sort of stuff. And once again, they don't take it home. So anyway. Um, yeah, so some great things. That, that helmet, I think they said that was flown uh, on Apollo. That was Jim Lovell's helmet on Apollo 8, was it? Flown helmet, I think he said. Yeah, there was so much stuff to look at. Um, computer in the middle there, I think it had like two megabytes of memory. This thing was about the size of a refrigerator. Yeah. Um, that uh, screen in the middle there, uh, it's probably hard to see, uh, showing a live track of what was happening. Uh, uh, as far as tracking from from Tibbin Bill itself, and top right hand corner is the moon rock. I've got a couple of shots on the next page. So this moon rock is the largest. Correct me if I'm wrong, gents. The largest moon rock sample outside the US. It's about well, about five, six, eight centimeters by about five centimeters. It's huge. So that was uh, collected on Apollo Eleven, and uh, what does it say here? 300 and sorry, 142 grams. So it's a beautiful, beautiful sample. And I did ask Glenn about the alarm system. I've got a reputation, right? And he said, uh, there's a camera up there, there's an alarm system here, there's a motion detector over there. And there's a, so he said, don't even try it, you'll, you'll be shot before you leave the gate. So I didn't try it. So uh, yeah, it was fun though, really good. So there's the geeks there with the moon rock. Um, left hand side, there's a feed horn from the decommissioned DSS 42 dish. And this graphic on the right hand side showing how big the dish. So essentially, um, DSS 43, the largest one at Tibbin Billa, is the one in the center. We all think the dish, the movie, the dish, the parks dish is blooming huge. That's the dishes on the right hand side. So it's it's a big dish, but look at the size of the, the uh, of uh, DSS forty three, and there's on the left hand side is the Hunnicycle Creek dish, and I think that's shown the same dish the middle the uh, second from the left on maximum tilt, which basically tilt down to the, to the ground. So just a couple other scene shots from uh, the museum itself, which the museum has been closed. But we walked in, I don't know whether Glenn fired all up for us, but everything was running, videos, lighting, the air conditioning was all running, wasn't it? So uh, maybe he just did it for us or maybe they just leave it like that, I don't know. I guess they've got 
exhibits in there. Maybe they have to preserve them. So maybe they have to keep the aircon on. I don't know. So it was a nice little display there on DSS 46, the Honeysuckle Creek dish, and a um, story about how that came to be. So while we were there, of course, the left-hand picture is when we first arrived. And once again, the world is round, Steve. And <laughs> we were talking about it. Um, and as the world is rotating, it was actually following Voyager 2. So you can see when we arrived, the dish was quite point up quite vertically. By the time we left, which is the right-hand picture, the dish had tilted. So um, I thought it was quite, quite interesting. Uh, that evening, we then um, met up with uh, Mike Din, uh, um, John Saxon and his wife, Betty, um, for a very pleasant uh, dinner. And uh, John Saxon's famous for his brag book. He is a folder of photographs. And so the space, space geeks went berserk. And of course, Betty has the patience of a saint and just sat back and let John and Mike go, you know. <laughs> but it was a great, great night. We had a bit echo now. What's happening? Okay. So that was, that was a great evening. So we left there and charged up the car a little bit and progressed into the next day, which is Sunday the 19th. So this is when we went out to the old Honeysuckle Creek tracking station with John Saxon. We met up with John in the morning. And, uh, and after that, we, we drove back to Melbourne. So top right-hand corner, you saw that picture before. That was the Honeysuckle Creek site with the uh, dish in its heyday in 1969. Not from the same angle, but below is a picture we took last weekend before last. So the hill is still there, but they've... Uh, I think the, for the Apollo 1150th, they put up uh, this uh, display, which basically says, if you can't read it, one small step, one giant leap. And uh, Mike was quite opinionated on that subject. It's supposed to be one giant leap for a man, or for a man. And apparently the um, political police said, no, we can't have man. We just, so anyway, they simplified it. I think it's perfect. So, yeah, it's quite funny. Um, so this is, uh, once again, a picture of Honeysuckle Creek. This is on the opening day, 1967. So for those who don't know, Honeysuckle Creek was a dedicated Apollo deep space communications facility, purely designed for that purpose. And this was the open day. And we being amateur archaeologists, we were at the site. So this is the same site where that building was. Uh, I believe the building was abandoned. They took all the equipment out and et cetera. Um, back in the mid eighties, uh, but then vandals got in there and did donuts inside the building and carried on. So they eventually demolished the building um, a few years later. So this is essentially all that's left. And I've got a red arrow there. You can't really see it in the shadow, but that railing and those steps are in that shaded area underneath the building. Just trying to get reference to where things are or were. And this is a, a bolt holding down one of the radios. Uh, I think it was a microwave tower and a rusty bolt. So they have done a, a bit of an effort to, to, poo, to tell the story, um, but of course, we're in Australia, everything has to be vandal proof. So they've got these heavy steel information uh, panels, uh, which tells the story and gives a bit of information. It's kind of simplified, you know, for kids and all that kind of stuff, but it's, like, it's nice. Um, so yeah, there we, we got uh, quite a, a guided tour and a, um, a lot of explanation and anecdotes from John out there. I don't know how many times he's done that, but he was very patient with us and answered all our questions and was quite happy to be there. And I, I don't even know how old he is, he's in his eighties. So we are so grateful to John for that. It was really appreciated. Mike was very keen to come, but he's he's got kind of got mobility issues now and couldn't really make it out, which we, he was, uh, I think he would have loved to have come. So this is the layout of the of the facility from Google Earth, uh, as it is today. So that uh, circle on the right, top right hand corner, is where the, the old dish was. The square sort of area is where the operations building is, and down the left hand corner is where the power the power station uh, was, where they had backup generators and that type of thing. So I've just overlaid a, a map that. Um, it's actually on Colin McKellar's website. Once again, honeysucklecreek.net 
uh, go to that website and you'll be lost for hours because it's full of information about not only Australia, but the global network and what happened. So yeah, so there's the uh, 85 foot antenna, the operations building, the transformers, the power building, et cetera. So you, that cur curved area is a road you come up on to, uh, to that side. And as we drove out, it was kind of nice, just on the right hand side, there's an open area and there's people in tents camping there. It's such a beautiful place. Even if you're not a space geek, going up there and camping would be just great. Maybe that's another space geek. Uh, I don't know about doing that because I don't, don't know about your uh, cooking, cooking uh, capabilities, Angela. Ooh, have a bunch of garlic. Yeah, so once again, there's a picture of the, the slope where the, the up, looking up towards where the dish was. Um, there's those information panels. And uh, I'm not going to read this all out, but there is a, um, a, a, a note acknowledging the important role uh, Honeysuckle Creek played in the uh, Apollo program. Uh, it was also used for the shuttle program and the Apollo Soyuz test program. And also talking to John and we sort of said, what's your favorite mission? He goes, Skylab, without hesitation. He, he thought, because Skylab is a long-term mission, right? Um, I think four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks or whatever, three. He said they were great. They were so good because it wasn't such a time intense thing and they could do a lot more. So it was really cool. So this is a, a pan shot of the, of, the, of the pad or the area where the dish was mounted. And to get a sense of what they've done, they put a, a tower in the middle to kind of represent the location of that dish and then put these information plaques at each of the four uh, hold down points uh, where the dish was um, was placed and it was welded down and also bolted down so it's still got the bolt there uh, sticking out of the concrete kind of nice so once again we're looking back at where at the station area now where the dish was and where the where the platform base is and i've just done a bit of a quick and dirty photoshop so to add in the, the dish, so you can kind of imagine the dish in operation at uh, that location. So quite, quite an impressive location and facility and very important to the whole network. So then it was time to leave. Michael had to get one last picture of a bolt, which, which is very important, I thought. And there's the picture there. I don't know if I took it or you took it, I don't know. But that was one of the bolts, was the mounting, that's when you took, of course. Um, holding down that microwave tower. So it was a fantastic trip. Full on space geek nuts we were. Um, anyone who's not a space geek or an EV geek would have been jumping out of the car at 80 miles an hour, but uh, we all had lots of fun. So special thanks um, to the following people. Glenn Nagel, the Outreach and Visitor Centre Manager at, uh, at the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex. Uh, he's a space and astronomy area and he works for CSIRO. Malcolm Davis, uh, he's a senior analyst at the Australian, space Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Really big space nut. Very deep knowledge of the Chinese space program. And... Uh, Michael and I drove out to Hanisa, uh, to Tibbin Bill with him and it was very enlightening. I can't tell you everything he said, I'd probably have to kill you, but uh, no, it was really interesting what he had to say about the whole geopolitics and space and the whole scene around that. So that was a really enjoyable trip. Um, I've mentioned Mike, Dean and Steve, John Saxon. This is them on the operations console in their... In their uh, full flare you notice everyone's got a cigarette and uh that's john on the left and mike on the right remember those headsets that um glenn nagel was holding up i don't know whether the same ones but they're the same era of headsets john saxon he was the operations supervisor at honeysuckle creek and after skylab and some unmanned missions he moved over to the canberra deep space tracking network in 1980 as the operations supervisor he also spent two years at JPL as a consultant and retired back in 1995. And Mike Din, he is at Canberra Deep Space Trekking Centre in 1966 as a deputy station director. He was in charge of operations. In 67, he moved over to Honeysuckle Creek when it was commissioned in a similar position. 
and he was involved in Apollo missions 7 to 14. Spent a year at JPL in 1972, and I think he actually managed to get into the Mission Control Center during uh, uh, the moonwalks there, sitting beside the guy that drove the camera on the rover. I think he was supposed to be there, and he kept suggesting things, and apparently the guy got a bit annoyed, but anyway, good place to be. Uh, he was a director of Tibbin Billa in 1988 until he retired in 94. And on the 25th anniversary, he managed to get um, the Apollo 11 moon rock for display. Now, I'm not sure whether that was the one that we saw or another one, because there's a few, actually, there's a few moon rocks in Australia. There's little granules at the Australian Archive, and then there's the one we saw, and there's another one that's in Sydney, I think. Anyway, I don't know. Ah, fantastic. Oh, okay. Which I believe John Saxon flew in business class. We had to go to Moonrock School at uh, at, uh, at Houston for a, a few days before he could take the Moonrock with him. <laughs> so had to look after your Moonrock. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty cool. So just a couple of shots. We also took a drive by the Parliament House, saw some protesters, which we still don't know what they want about, but. They were very committed and um, look, they're uh, having a good time. A uh, little panorama there of uh, the Canberra Deep Space Tracking Network and then the bottom, a little panorama of uh, Honeysuckle Creek. All those pink things there covers on plants which they're trying to grow, which I don't know, it might change the look of the place. But anyway, and that was fun. So thanks, gents. It was awesome. And I'm done. Right. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, as you can see, my name's Andrew Rennie, and we're going to go from last month's talk, where I didn't quite finish, uh, to 2010, the year 2010. All right. Now, I have, ah, oh, there it is. Many of you will not have heard of the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. This is a satellite in Earth orbit, which is able to measure billions of kilometers away, the boundary between interstellar space and our heliosphere. That is the boundary between, yes, Good one, thanks. Uh, okay, the boundary between our heliosphere, that is the magnetic and particle fields around our sun and the interstellar uh, area. So let's go. IBEX, that's the satellite. It's about the size of a, uh, with my hands about that big, it's not very big. And it has this um, telescope, but it's not a telescope that picks up light. It's a telescope that picks up neutral particles. That is atoms that are not charged, not ionized. Now the heliosphere surrounding our solar system is formed by the interaction between the solar wind and the partially ionized local interstellar medium. That is the stuff in interstellar space. Now, the interstellar plasma consists mostly of hydrogen and helium uh, ions, is slowed by at the bow wave upstream of the heliopause and diverted around the heliopause. So charged particles do not enter our solar system. The Voyager spacecraft are now both in interstellar space, having passed through the, the heliopause and outside of our thing. Now, particles coming in, I hope you can see the, oh, yes, you can, good. Uh, particles coming in here, if they are electrically charged, will be diverted by our magnetic field and stream around us. However, neutral particles are not affected by magnetic fields 
and they will just carry straight on through. Right? But most of these particles are traveling fairly slowly. So I've said that the interstellar neutral atoms can go through our heliopause and continue straight on through our solar system. The low energy interstellar neutrals are detected directly by the IBEX satellite, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer, near the Earth, and also by the Ulysses, an instrument on Ulysses. But they may also undergo charge exchange collisions inside the heliosphere. And of course, once they get charged, they're no longer traveling straight lines, they're traveling curves. So the ionization of interstellar neutrals in the supersonic uh, solar wind and inner heliosphere produces energetic pickup ions that dominate the plasma pressure. That is, there's an actual pressure in space, believe it or not, it's, it's measurable. Through another charge exchange collision, the pickup ions can create energetic neutral atoms at energies much greater than the interstellar neutrals. And these go heading off in some, all directions, away from the sun and towards the sun. And some of them reach the Earth. And some of them reach the satellite, which is in orbit around the Earth. And they're detected by the instrument. So this instrument is picking up both the slow neutral atoms and the high speed atoms that are originating from the cosmic rays. And why is that important? Well, say so IBEX measures the energetic neutral atom fluxes at energies up to roughly six kilo electron volts and, from all, and that's from all directions in the sky. In other words, it gets a whole completely four pi steradian view of our environment. And it's been doing so since 2009. Well, what's new? That paper I showed you begins to look at the material. Now, these are the sort of pictures that it, gets, it is able to accumulate showing where the atoms are coming from. And it varies with time. Why is that? Because the sun has coronal mass ejections. And these travel out from the sun and take several years to reach the heliopause. Those charged particles interact with cosmic rays and can neutralize the, the charged cosmic rays and become fast traveling neutral atoms, which can take anything from several hours to several months to reach back to Earth. Now I talked about a pressure in space. Nanopascals is the pressure, nano is billionths of a pascal is the pressure. And you see how it varies over time from 2012 to 2018. And here's the solar uh, wind dynamic pressure in nanopascals, again, varying with time. And there's a weighted average here with helio latitude and solar wind speed. So the wind speed varies as, and that pushes this heliopause out and back according to the activity of the sun. All right, let's move on. So what's new? Well, here's how it happens. Let's uh, zoom in again. And so here we have a high pressure front coming out from the sun. And after several years, it reaches the heliopause and causes a, a pressure front, which can cause a pressure wave through the heliopause, which hits the outside and bounces back. And during that bounce back, there is a energetic 
neutral atoms, ENA is energetic neutral atoms, are uh, caused to start moving and they move in towards the sun. Now, over here, we have a simulation of how that happens. So we've got the pressure front arriving out, affecting the heliopause and particles start coming in, which are not shown. All right. And uh, we'll leave that one behind. So that's an overall summary of some of the data that's, that's come back. They have to process it. And we have initial response time, mean response time, initial uh, response uncertainty, and then they get the, the final picture. And we should be really looking at the right-hand side here now. So our, about, we're looking then at the density of material at the heliopause and also the distance it is away from the sun, and it varies. As you know, probably remember, Voyager 1 crossed the heliopause several times because it crossed it once, then the sol this coronal mass ejection traveling about four years out pushed the boundary out and put the Voyager 1 back inside the heliopause sphere, and then Voyager 1 overtook it again and went outside. So we had several crossings of Voyager 1. I can't remember what happened to Voyager 2. Okay, so anyway, that's the sort of pictures we're getting of the conditions out there. How? From a satellite that's in orbit around the Earth. And the data can be quite complex, so I will skip over that. And this is the distance from the sun in astronomical units. So you can see how it's varied with time. All right, let's move on to. And here's, uh, from that, they can get a picture of the shape of the heliospores. And you see it's, it's quite varied. And this is view from the north and south and that little from the side, side view. Okay, move on. And from that, we can make a sort of a 3D model of the heliopause. And for comparison, we have the direction of Voyager 1 that was traveling and Voyager 2 that traveled through it. All right. Now, moving on to another thing that's come up. James Webb Space Telescope has been in space now for over a year. And even during 2021, uh, sorry, 2022, we were getting some results. And this, I think they've put the wrong date on this. <laughs> I think this is supposed to be 2023, January 10th. Uh, and any look at the evolution and galaxy structure has been analyzed by the people and presented at this conference, the Australian, the American Association of Science meeting in Seattle earlier this year. And here is uh, some of the findings, looking at some of the early galaxies and their different shapes. And I'm not going to try and interpret those for you, but the pictures are just drawn out from those tiny little specks. So when you look at uh, an overall James Webb Space Telescope picture, you see all these dots. If you enlarge them up, you can find some uh, interesting structure in it. And so they, they present, she talked for about half an hour about the different uh, structures that found. All right, moving on to uh, Hayabusa. Now Hayabusa 2, uh, went out to the asteroid Ryugu, picked up uh, two samples, and then came back to Earth, landed in Australia, and the results were then taken to uh, Japan and analysed. And uh, papers have been published now on some of the results, this one from October last year. And They are comparing, this MZ is the uh, atomic mass uh, number. 
So one is hydrogen, two, uh, four is helium and so on. And you can see uh, they're able to analyze the material that's in the samples. Okay, let's go on. And they're able to work out the isotope ratios. And the straight line one is compared to on earth. And here we find, for example, helium four is enhanced in the sample. And one of those, uh, Krypton 84, for example, is, de is depressed compared to what you'd find on earth. So they're analyzing the materials in the thing. This can tell you the history of the sample. And they've analyzed the volatiles that came back as well, the, the gases uh, that came back. And they've been published in October last year. And from that, we work out a history of the of Ryugu. First, Ryugu was formed in the solar uh, primordial gases, formed a body. And then later, there was aqueous alteration of the parent body about four and a half billion years ago. Then, the particles reaccumulated, which makes it now a rubble pile. And then at some point about 5 million years ago, Ryugu migrated from its orbit out there to an inner one, which now brings it close to the earth. From that point, there's two theories about how the material uh, formed. Path A suggested that about a million years ago, there was reddening uh, by heating. Whereas path B, another alternative theory is that it just went directly from the migrated one into the banding that we now see. So we're still quite not sure exactly the history of Ryugu, but we've now got a pretty good idea. This compares your amount of argon with other terrestrial and uh, uh, samples that we've had, mainly from meteorites. We'll skip on because it's a little complicated to explain. But what we've got here is a diagram of the surface of Ryugu. This is the interior down here. Solar wind can't penetrate because the particles aren't energetic enough, can't penetrate the surface. So when they hit the surface materials, they affect only the very surface. That rock there is this one here. And you see it's been altered by the solar wind. That cosmic rays, on the other hand, they're traveling at very near the speed of light, and they can affect it down to a depth of about two meters. And so the materials inside Ryugu are altered in ways that the ones on the surface are not. Okay. They've also been able to compare the minerals in Ryugu with those from Comet 81P or Wild 2. And with X ray. Uh, fluorescence, we can tell red is where the iron is, green where the sulfur is, and blue is oxygen. So a lot of oxygen in this particular rock. Over here, we have uh, in different frequencies, the magnesium is red, calcium is green, and aluminium is blue. Very little aluminium. And that's a black and white picture. All right. And likewise, they've been able to analyze the rocks. So we won't go into the details of that. And they can work out the ratios of the different oxygen isotopes in it. Again, telling us how old the rock is and its history. And again, some more samples here of Ryugu. It's quite worthwhile enlarging these up. All right, let's move on. 
Now, there's another mission out there. It's called Osiris Rex. It too has picked up samples from the uh, from the comet, and it's on the way back to Earth. We won't land in Australia though; it's landing in Utah. But they've prepared a clean room at the Johnson Space Centre, and this is the team that's working on the on the clean room and preparing it. And you see the gowning rooms and the main analyzing rooms, very similar to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, which I visited once, but it's much more developed than that. And uh, these people here at this, uh, at this conference uh, were presenting the details about that. Another thing presented at the conference, I did a screen grab, a few screen grabs from them as well. And um, do you remember that Green Bank radio telescope that collapsed, just ended up tumbled thing? Well, they've, for a long time, nothing was going to happen. And then they rebuilt, well, they didn't rebuild it, they built a new one. And this is it, the new telescope. And Patrick Taylor uh, gave some of the early results and have quite a fascinating talk. The transmitter built by Ray, Ray, Raytheon. And interestingly, the transmitter is only 700 watts of power. The finest resolution at 700 watts, some of these lights are probably brighter than that, uh, is one meter. And they did some observations in 2020, 2021. And this is one of the Apollo 15 landing site. Now you can probably recognize bits and pieces in there. All right. But I've got, I've got one, got one better than that. This is the best resolution at 1.25 meter resolution. And you can see Hadley Rill here quite clearly. You can probably re remember where the Apollo landing site was, Apollo 15 landing site and the hills that surround it. So there is pretty amazing talk and what they're doing with that radar. Now, you can't believe what you read, get on, uh, on Fox News or Sky News Australia, because as you can see, oh dear, oh well. So we have an enormous galaxy. <laughs> okay, fake news. All right, let's move on. Now, uh, have I got any still time? Left? Oh, okay. On the, I have a habit, a very uh, bad habit of looking for things that are hidden normally. And on the European Space Agency's website, I found three hidden videos. No caption, no explanation, no links to them from anywhere else that I could see. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, what on earth is this? And I think, okay, this is obviously in Russia. And it's a heat shield of some sort. And I think, okay, what are the Russians and America and, and the Europeans been working on together? Well, ExoMars, I thought. Yeah, ExoMars. And I thought, gee, I didn't know they're going to use inflatable technology on ExoMars. Maybe I didn't, didn't know enough about it. After all, the entry vehicle is a Russian one. So here we go, we're watching this being tested out. Two sort of inflatable materials. Okay. So then the second video I looked at, this is obviously a, a high speed one. and watch it glow. And I'm sitting there watching this and saying, what on, what is this? Was it cooking? 
<laughs> All right. Now, just to... Uh, Anyway, so that video goes on for another half minute. Oh, there it goes. So this is obviously a re-entry vehicle of some sort. So I'm thinking, why is this Russian thing, obviously a Russian one, why is it on the European Space Agency website? And I'm thinking ExoMars, ExoMars. Well, as you'll find out in a moment, I was wrong. And the thing settled down. All right. So ExoMars. Here's the uh, the carrier craft. There's the uh, the entry capsule containing Kazachuk and uh, the uh, Rosalind Franklin rover, and it's about to hit the atmosphere. On the ground, we would have had the Kazachuk lander and aboard it the Rosalind Franklin, the European Space Agency's rover, which is about, about to roll down the ramp. All right. But when I went searching for how is this thing going to actually land and get there, I, I found this on the Russian website. The thing, and there's no sign there of any sort of inflatable material. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, so maybe it's not ExoMars. And then the third video on the European Space Agency site gave me the clue. That is obviously a Volna launch from a submarine. Volna is a, formerly a, a, a you know, submarine launch nuclear missile, but it's... Uh, obviously doing some sort of testing. Now look at this, what happens? It separates and then detaches a capsule. And then another capsule. And then obviously the entry uh, ah, and there's the inflatable. And it gets hot, like we saw in that other video. It's now coming down into the... Ah, and there's the second one that we saw. Ah, now we've got the right thing, the real deal. But what is it? and it lands. Now, so then I asked Mr. Google, a good friend, Mr. Google, all sorts of search terms, and I came up with this. Inflatable reentry and descent technology, IRDT, and some things I've done with it. And it says the new lightweight inflatable da, 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 has been demonstrated in a first flight test in February of 2000 within the Babakan Space Center. Da, 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 da. This technology is designed to reduce the mass and cost of future reentry systems for Earth and planetary. This paper outlines further technology development with a second flight test in 2001 and the definition of an operational International Space Station download system. So they're looking for something from download. Now, what they did was just to, I think I've kind of 
leave you with that picture just for a moment. What, what they did was they launched a progress vehicle to the International Space Station. And from it, they deployed this reentry test as we were, which followed the scenarios being shown here. But it failed, didn't work. So then they used the Volner test and they launched that and there's the Volner being launched, separates the, uh, let's move it down. You see separates as shown in the video and it comes down, error breaks and lands. But guess what? It failed, didn't work. So they're going to try a third one. Now, here's what, what happened. The submarine launch we saw was over here in the Barents Sea, went across the Arctic Ocean, across um, there, and landed in Kamchatka. But they lost it. They couldn't find it. So it was a failure. All right. Here's another diagram of the, uh, you know, the reentry vehicle and how it was packaged up. Another one of the packaging and how it should have looked during reentry. Now, where did this technology come from? Well, one thing in the pipe and that paper scientific paper that I sh showed a part of there said it was developed from technology used for the Mars 96 mission. Now that was a mission which was very, very ambitious and very complicated and had countries, various countries involved. What happened to it eventually was it got into Earth orbit, but didn't leave Earth orbit and eventually it crashed back to Earth. Well, here's the orbiter. And they had two re-entry vehicles, which were going to take down surface stations, not rovers, but surface stations to the surface. All right. So here was the plan. Talks about an aero breaking screen of 100 centimeters. Two small auto autonomous stations, which were separate before landing, da, 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 and they were going to land in those places. All right, that seemed okay. I looked like I might be on the right track here. And when I saw this, I thought, ah, that's that thing being deployed. The, the balloon error braking system. And then it shows it, 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 it coming down. And then an inflatable balloon deployed during the descent and that bounces to a surface and opens up the lander. Uh, I'm looking at that and saying, well, it doesn't quite fit. And then I realized Mars 96 was also gonna have two probes that were gonna hit and go into the soil. And when I looked at that picture there, I thought, that looks like those folded up heat shield. And I thought, yeah, maybe. And there it is. In the Martian atmosphere, the probes undergo aerodynamic braking, first using a rigid cone and then an air inflated braking device given a velocity is reached to provide their penetration into the Martian regulus. There it is. So that's where the technology came from, developed for the Mars 96 mission. A bit more searching with Mr. Google, finds me two pictures of the probes about to enter. And you can see that this is where they, the balloon, call them balloons, but they're not really, the inflatable heat shield is stored. And on the Russian website, we find, Here's the Mars 96 orbiter deploying the, uh, the penetrators. 
And yes, it opens up just as shown in the picture and boom, into the surface it goes. So mystery pretty much solved. And another artist impression shows the orbiter and the descent impact. So that was it. So what happened then? They developed the beginnings of the technology with the Mars 96 mission. European Space Agency got involved later with uh, developing it for trying to develop new planetary landing systems or for returning cargo from the International Space Station. And that reminded me, well, of course, the Russians would be involved in that because after all, didn't they have a working completely well working heat shield for the Jupiter entry mission of the Leonov in the movie to 2010. Remember that? So of course they had the technology already because it was developed for, for this mission, 2010. And there's the heat shield having just been now being jettisoned, having done its job. There's the inflatable heat shield being deployed. All right. Quickly, quickly, uh, those three pictures taken on different dates show the, here's the rover, Zirong, the Martian, the, uh, the Russian, uh, so the Chinese rover, and it's moved down here, and then over there, and that's in September, and uh, I'm sure re fairly recently, it hasn't moved. In other words, it was put into hibernation for the winter and the dust, dust storm period, and it hasn't moved since then because we've been watching, waiting for news that it's moving, but it's not. And looking at those two pictures and enlarging it, this is the early one, early in the mission. And this is the more recent one, just uh, a few weeks ago now. And it shows a lot of dust on the panels. So it looks like Zirong probably has done the same as Opportunity failed because of dust on its solar panels. Not sure yet, but it's looking that way. All right. And talking of Zirong, a paper has come out recently showing the Martian soil, and they've got a radar. I've talked about it previously about on the moon, how the U-2 rovers use a ground penetrating radar. Zirong's doing the same thing. And here is a picture. And look at that feature there. This is the surface here, zero is the surface. And this is going down four and a half meters with a ground penetrating radar. And we're seeing buried craters. This is a crater, it's been buried. Why is it being buried? Well, there's plenty of dust and stuff blowing around, Aeolian erosion. And this diagram, there's a picture of, the, of the, an area. This shows the traverse. And the area that's marked there, which I'll enlarge for you here, is the part that's shown in this part down below. And again, we can see a buried crater here. All right. And uh, some more of those sorts of, so it's done this on a, on a number of things and it's revealing craters that are buried now. And you'd walk across it and you wouldn't know they're there, but they're there. All right. Now, I came across this little Twitter exchange. You know how people have these Twitter fights, like birds fighting each other, you know? Elon Musk, my car is currently orbiting Mars. Jonathan McDowell, who most of you are familiar with, he's an astrophysicist at the um, Smithsonian Observatory in, in America, says, well, no, it's orbiting the sun and occasionally passes the orbit of Mars. Not the same thing. And someone called Alonzo, who died and made you the orbital police? Jonathan McDowell, Johannes Kepler. <laughs> All right, so that's my talk.
Thanks, Ash. Uh, okay, so that's the end of the meeting tonight. Thanks everyone for coming along and particularly thank you to Andrew for his work he put it in together to get that presentation done. And um, and also, actually, he always gets here a couple of hours before everyone else does and is always here a couple of hours after everyone's left. And he lives in New South Wales, so I don't know where he lives, a long way away. So thank you, particularly Ashley, and it was fantastic. And um, thanks, gents, once again for that trip the other week. Uh, we'll be back uh, 27th of March, I think I said. Uh, if anyone's going to the air show, I'm going on Thursday. I'm going to try and do a bit of space geekery out there. And um, have a pleasant evening. Look forward to seeing you all next month and safe drive home if you're driving. And you can unmute yourself and have a chat if you'd like. And once again, if you want to be one of the presenters, either here in the room or uh, via Zoom on International Space News or Australian Space News, send us an email, info at space.asn.au and present your credentials. And uh, which means, are you, do you have a pulse? Um, and, uh, and we'd love to have a chat with you. Thanks everyone, good night.